All right, we have a lot of news stories to go over today. Let's get right into it. We're starting with Apple Intelligence. iOS version 18.1 was just released to the general public and now includes Apple Intelligence. Basically what they sold the iPhone 16 for with promoting Apple Intelligence everywhere now comes a month plus later. And let's just get it out of the way. It is underwhelming. I've been playing around with it in beta for a couple weeks now, and I really haven't been able to find much value from it. Now, there there are a couple cool features, which I will go over in a second, but it is far from what Apple intelligence was promised to be. Looking at the Apple intelligence homepage on apple.com, Look at some of these features that they show. What Apple promises having a small model on your phone that would have context on everything that you have on your phone, contacts, emails, text messages, apps, pretty much everything and it doesn't have any of that. Look at this right here. It's simply just searching across multiple apps. It doesn't really do that. Here it's showing custom emojis and custom images, basically text to image, and I don't even have access to that yet. So what does it have? Well, it has the writing features that we're probably all pretty familiar with at this point. Basically rewriting or prompt to writing, all stuff that we get in basically every other app that we use. One of the most useful features that I've found is notification roll-ups. Basically, you get a ton of notifications and you have to scroll through all of them and it's probably not all that meaningful, but what it'll do now is just give you a very brief summary of all the notifications within a stack. And I actually found that very, very useful. The only other feature that I've attempted to use that has been somewhat useful is being able to describe an album in Apple Photos and it creates you an album. But here's the thing. Apple Photos is not that good. I tried to switch from Google Photos to Apple Photos and it just is missing core functionality that is required for me to switch over to it. Siri isn't even all that much better. You ask it a question, it definitely can answer some things, but then it offloads to ChatGPT. And that's fine, but I also have access to ChatGPT in like 30 other different ways. Really what I'm looking for is OpenAI's advanced voice mode built into the phone natively as Siri. Why can't I just have that? It seems so easy and so obvious. So definitely try it out. It's worth it if you already have one of these newer phones. So you need an iPhone 15 or 16 to use these features. And I'm glad Siri is getting an update, but this just isn't where I need it to be to be really impressed yet. So let me know what you think. Have you played around with it? Drop some comments and let me know if you're impressed. Thanks to the sponsor of this video, Langtrace, the open source and open telemetry based evaluation platform that helps you improve your LLM powered applications. Langtrace helps developers collect and analyze traces, create data sets, and run evaluations to help you understand the performance and accuracy of your applications. It offers end-to-end -end observability and now offers native support for tracing DSPy framework sessions. It provides a custom dashboard with detailed views so you can trace DSPy workflows from chain of thought to evaluation. This allows developers to trace tasks, tools, and memory with precision. Plus, with prompt engineering versus debugging modes, developers can switch between optimizing prompts and resolving issues, streamlining LLM performance. So use Langtrace to track your AI-powered applications from end to end. Check out and star Langtrace's GitHub page for the latest updates and join the community of innovators. And you can start using Langtrace today with a 20% discount if you use the link in the description below. Lastly, join one of their future webinars to see how Langtrace can take your LLM apps from development to deployment. Thank you again to Langtrace for sponsoring this video. Now, Back to the video. Next, GitHub had their annual event and they released a ton of updates which really show the direction that it's going. First, developers now have a choice in GitHub Copilot. And if you don't remember, just a couple years ago, GitHub Copilot was really the first time that we saw AI coding assistance. And it really blew my mind completely. You would just start typing a piece of code and it could finish it for you simply by hitting tab. Obviously we've come a long way since then, but now GitHub is releasing some more flexibility. So first, GitHub, if you don't know, is owned by Microsoft. So keep that in mind while I tell you about all of these updates. GitHub is now allowing you to choose the model that powers the tab completion. So as you can see here, they're offering Claude 3.5 Sonnet, Gemini 1.5 Pro, and even 01 Preview. So diversifying away from OpenAI, but yet still offering the cutting edge models from OpenAI. Now, in my mind, this continues the Microsoft strategy of diversifying away 
from being so dependent on open AI. And I think that's a really smart move. As a company, you don't want to rely on a single partner for all of your basically core features for the foreseeable future. So now you can figure out which model is best for whatever use case that you need. Here it says the Cloud 3.5 Sonnet excels at coding tasks across the entire software development lifecycle. Google's Gemini 1.5 Pro shows high capabilities in coding scenarios. It has a built-in 2 million token context window, which which is enough to essentially fit the entire code base of many, if not most code bases out there. Then of course we have the O1 models, which are best at complicated coding tasks. And now GitHub is also releasing a preview of their essentially prompt to code product called Spark. They describe it as an AI native tool to build applications entirely in natural language. Sparks are fully functional micro apps that can integrate AI features and external data sources without requiring any management of cloud resources. So they're definitely going after the cursors of the world with this launch. So as really the first product to integrate AI so deeply and natively into itself, I'm glad to see GitHub trying to keep up with the crazy pace of AI coding assistance. Next, it is reported by the information that Meta is developing their own search engine and I think it's a great call. Google has had an absolute search monopoly, search dominance for the last two decades. And Meta with Facebook hasn't been able to break into it after multiple attempts. But now is kind of a unique time. Google is under threat by companies like Perplexity and now Meta. Meta has the Llama models. They already have hundreds of millions of monthly active users using their Llama models, Meta AI. And all they really have to do now is just insert real-time search into it. Obviously, it's a lot more complicated than that, but from a strategic point of view, it is that simple. Simply allow it to crawl the web, and Meta has been crawling the web for a long time. They've been reported recently to be increasing their efforts to crawl the web, and we already know that they've allowed you to drop pixels for their advertising business all over the internet for a long time. So it's a really interesting time to look at Google. Google is under severe threat. They are not only being threatened to be broken up, but also their core money-making machine, basically the greatest business of all time, Google search, is under serious threat. AI is changing everything, and Google doesn't seem to be evolving their search fast enough. For me, I use Perplexity and ChatGPT about 95% of the time where I would have used Google search before. I now only really use Google search if I know exactly where I want to go and I just don't know how to get there. For example, if I'm looking for a specific type of image, or a website and I just forgot the URL, that's when I use Google search. But anything else, I just want the answer. I don't want 10 blue links. And so I cannot wait to see what Meta does in the search realm. It is also reported that Meta recently struck a deal with Reuters to deliver real-time news and updates through its Meta AI platform. I am incredibly bullish on Meta AI in general, but there's one thing that Meta is really missing, which is the hardware. They have the Meta AI Ray-Ban glasses, and that's great, but I made a video a few weeks ago detailing why I don't think glasses are the final form factor of artificial intelligence, even though Mark Zuckerberg does. I just don't think that's it. So we will see, but you know what? The more competition in search, the better. Next, Grok finally gets vision. Grok can now understand images. And funnily enough, I thought it already did. We saw a preview of this so long ago from Elon Musk, only really just showing screenshots of what's possible through a blog post. But now apparently it really does have vision. Now, one of the vision tests that I added to my rubric because I saw it from the Grok preview is this. Basically explain this meme. Here's startups on the left, big companies on the right. I loaded it into Grok and now I say explain this meme and now for the first time it can actually do it and here's the example it got it right it's great and so that's a cool update and I cannot wait for Grok 3 though because that seems to be coming very soon next perplexity is being sued by the Wall Street Journal and the New York Post and this comes after nearly three dozen lawsuits have already been filed against generative AI companies this is a sticky situation because these generative AI companies are starting to be the front page of the internet whereas Google was previously the front page of the internet 
Google would scrape a website and show the results in its search results and then send it off to whatever that content publisher was. But now rather perplexity and other AI search tools are simply regurgitating the information that was in those articles and the need to actually click through and go to the original content is basically no longer there. These content companies are saying that the AI search companies are ingesting their results and presenting them without their permission. And while that might be the case, this business model is not going to go away. AI search is here to stay. And in their response to the lawsuits, they even said they're proud to have launched its first of its kind revenue sharing program with leading publishers like Time, Fortune, Der Spiegel, and others. And it's interesting, it feels very familiar where over the years, every time a new technology has come out, content creators have either taken one of two positions, highly adoptive of this new technology or suing out of existence. We saw that with MP3s, we saw that with Google search, we saw that with a bunch of different iterations of technology. Every time I talk about copyright with AI, I think you guys have a pretty different idea than I do on what it should be. Now that I'm a content creator, the only thing I really want is the option to decide whether I want AI to ingest my content or not. That's the only thing I want, just the option. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Next, in a massive update that I think went under the radar slightly, Claude can now write and execute code. This is basically like ChatGPT's advanced data analysis feature. And the ability for AI to be able to write code and then execute the code allows it to be much more accurate. And I'm gonna give you a perfect example. Count the letters in the word strawberry. Now, obviously a lot of these models have learned to do it, but previously, if they were just able to write Python code that can take a string, count the letters of R, and then output the result, it would have been able to get it a long time ago. And so the ability for these models to be able to write code and then execute the code will allow them to accomplish many more use cases that were previously impossible based on the Transformers architecture. Next, back to perplexity, the native Mac OS desktop app is now out. I installed it immediately. I've been using it. It's awesome. I highly recommend you get it. I absolutely love perplexity. They do not pay me whatsoever. This is just something that I use day in and day out. As I already mentioned, ChatGPT and Perplexity are the two pieces of software that I use all the time for anything that I want to know. Next, Llama has released two quantized versions of their already small models. So what does that actually mean? Quantized versions are basically like compressed versions of the model. They're smaller and hopefully with that reduced size, you can run it on many more types of machines. Now the trade-off is a reduction in quality, but a lot of quantization techniques now really don't have all that much loss in quality. So they release quantized versions of Llama 3.21b and 3b that deliver up to two to four times increases in inference speed and on average 56% reduction in model size and 41% reduction in memory footprint. These are on-device models. These are models meant to run on the edge. They're open source, highly efficient, and I love it. As I've said many times, smaller models can likely accomplish the vast majority of use cases for the vast majority of people. They perform very, very well. They're only getting better. They're only getting smaller. They're only getting more efficient. And this is what I love to see. I wanna be able to run my own models on my devices without having to hit the cloud. And there are many reasons that I want that. Privacy, security, low latency, just ownership. I want the model in my hands. So I'm really glad to see this. I haven't tested it myself yet, but let me know if you have, let me know how they perform for you. Next, Cerebrus, who makes custom chips to run AI, has improved their speed of inference significantly. Let's take a look. Cerebrus inference is now three times faster. Llama 3.170B just broke 2100 tokens per second crazy fast, 16 times faster than the fastest GPU solution, eight times faster than GPUs running Llama 3B. And I've just been super impressed by everything that Cerebrus has done. And just a few weeks ago, they filed to go public. So if you wanna own a piece of it, you might be able to pretty soon. Next in absolutely fantastic news, especially for the US, TSMC, who makes computer chips, their Arizona facility has outpaced production in Taiwan, which is just insane to think about. Production yields in Arizona are now four percentage points higher than Taiwan, and that plant only began production earlier this year. 
I love the investment in the US. I love being able to build our chips here because that really de-risks us from having to depend on other countries for what is inevitably going to be probably the most important resource in the future. Next, Waymo, the company that offers autonomous vehicles. It's in service right now in multiple cities. They're doing 100,000 rides per week. They are probably the furthest along in terms of actual rides, has raised a ton of new funding. Today, we're excited to announce that we've closed an oversubscribed investment round of 5.6 billion led by Alphabet. Alphabet is where Waymo was created, Alphabet being Google, with continued participation from Andreessen, Fidelity, Perry Creek, Silver Lake, Tiger Global, and T. Rowe Price. Right now, they're in service in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Phoenix, and are partnering with Uber. They're just making a lot of great moves. Now, here's the thing with Waymo. They are very expensive to make, the vehicles, that is. They use LiDAR, they use radar, they use a suite of other sensors, whereas Tesla took the exact opposite approach. They're just using cameras. And logically, I think the camera-only approach kind of makes more sense to me. We only have eyes, we interpret the world around us, and we can drive cars. So why can't we get neural networks to do the same? I think we can just by using cameras. Now, obviously, using radar is probably gonna be much better in the short term, but I think in the long term, vision-only AI is going to win. Now, of course, there's one downside. If the vision of your camera is blocked in any way, let's say there's moisture on the camera, there's rain, fog, sand, dirt, anything, basically, you can't use them anymore. So they really need to solve for that as well. But congratulations to Waymo for the huge raise. I have not actually used one and I cannot wait to do so. Next, Kim, AKA Chubby, has noticed that there's a new unknown model that beats all the other image models by a significant amount according to artificial analysis. So it's called Red Panda, and according to its arena ELO, it is beating all the other models greatly. And by the way, Chubby has been writing incredible original articles for the Forward Future newsletter for weeks now. And if you haven't read them, they are interesting, they dive deep, they're technical, so please check it out, forwardfuture.ai. So I haven't tested the Red Panda model myself, but I do plan to, and I can't wait to use it. Next, apparently Google is going to release agents directly in the Chrome browser to do your browsing for you. This is called Jarvis, and it can do everything from doing research to booking a flight to purchasing products. And it is consumer facing and meant to automate everyday tasks. Now we just saw Claude released a way for Claude to control your computer and now Google is doing the same, but within your browser. According to this article, given a command action, Jarvis works by taking frequent screenshots of what's on their computer screen and interpreting the shots before taking actions like clicking on a button or typing into a text field. It operates relatively slowly because the model needs to think for a few seconds before taking each action. This is exactly the same way that we've seen previous open source computer control systems like Open Interpreter. This is how Claude works. And again, I said it before, it doesn't work all that well. Taking screenshots and trying to figure out what the coordinates are is just really difficult for AI to do, and it just doesn't work all that well. But of course, I wanna see it in action. It wouldn't take all that much for Chrome because they own not only the browser, but they also own the model to essentially open up an API that will tell you exactly where each pixel is and allow AI to much more effectively control the browser. And last, Stable Diffusion 3.5 Medium is now out. This is an open source text to image model and it is extremely good. Take a look at this. Now, this new update is specifically for 3.5 Medium. For the Medium model specifically, we made several adjustments to the architecture and training protocols to enhance quality, coherence, and multi-resolution generation abilities. It outperforms other medium-sized models offering a balance of prompt adherence and image quality, making it a top choice for efficient, high-quality performance. And Medium is meant to be run on device. If you want me to load it up on my two RTX A6000s, I'm happy to do so and test it out. Let me know. So that's it for today. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving a like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.